In 2001, I was on my way with my family to the United States of America. Before we left, we went to say goodbye to my then 90-year-old aunt. As we walked into the room, my six-year-old son ran up to her and said, Auntie, we're going to the United States. I'm going to America. Nostalgia covered her face as she looked at him, and she said, Ah, oh, America. I remember the first time I went there. I was 16 years old. It took me three months to get there. Panicking, my six-year-old turned around, looked at me and said, Mom, please tell me we're taking a different airline. <laughs> he was right. In his world, the distance between Tel Aviv and New York is just a night's sleep away, definitely not something that requires three months of travel. By the time he will have a six-year-old of his own, it'll probably be even shorter. We are world changers. We shape, create, design, and manipulate the environment and our bodies to fit our needs, to make our dreams come true. And we are the only organism on Earth who does that. How come? What is it that makes us, on one hand, part of this amazing living world, 99% of our DNA shared with it, approximately, and on the other hand, so different? There are different answers that are given to this question. All of them are correct, none of them is sufficient enough. If you look out there, you will see, some of us will say, we are the complex tool builders of the world. Well, that's correct, but so is this nest. No less complex, this is a nest of sociable weavers. Sometimes it will inhabit up to 100 pairs. They work together, creating chambers, raising each other's uh, young, helping each other in, communi in community and communication, turning their nest not only to a nest of many, but into a city. This little fellow was standing on top of a hill. It was snowing, it was freezing, the wind was blowing, and I was watching him as he found a very unique way to create his nest. The chin-strapped penguins create nests by bringing rocks, and placing them, and stones placing them and creating their nests. So he stood there watching his peers as they went down and up the hill, bringing stones up against the wind in the freezing weather. He was just standing there, and each time one of them turned his back on him, he rushed up to their nest, stole the stone that they brought, and ran to his own nest. And then stood there, completely innocent. Finally, they caught the thief. And I can tell you that I heard a lot of squeaking in a huge racket. I have no idea what they were saying to each other. They were not happy. There was a lot of punishment going on. One of the answers that we give is that we are probably the only species that understands what time is. We can plan far away, far away plans for years to come. We understand what existence is, what it means not to exist. Well, for 24 hours, I witnessed a parade of elephants walk up to the corpse of their peer, who was devoured a couple of hours uh, earlier by a pack of hunting lions. Some of them stood vigil. The others walked up, one after the other, bowed their heads, and then went back, making room for the next one in line to come up. Some of them even took their trunks and put it on the corpse of their friend. They were showing not only evident grief, but they were actually showing recognition that there is life and there is death. And this very well-documented uh, leaf-cutting ant takes that leaf, brings it into its nest. There, it will chew the leaf, spit it out, and create the substrate on that substrate, it raises a fungus, a very specific fungus. These ants prune, manure, and weed their crops. They raise their own food. Are we the only ones doing agriculture here? So it's all out there. Anything that you can think of, we find in the living world. And through the process of evolution, it continued to develop and to amplify itself until, until some, through primates and through uh, hominids, 
until some 200,000 years ago, a species developed that took all of this and added amplification, meaning, and synergy between all of these traits that I have already mentioned. The species that we call Homo sapiens sapiens, Latin for wise, wise men. That's us. We are not only storytellers, but we are story makers. We take our stories, the gossip that we tell each other, the stories and the imagination that we like to develop, and we make them come true. 7,500 years ago, the, this uh, pack of hunting bushmen in Africa told us a story of their hunting. We can still understand it today and continue to hunt. We are still doing the same making of stories. We believe in our stories so much that only a couple of years ago, uh, we learned that there is a group of doctors in Nottingham in England who actually spent time and money researching a man and his habits, and they decided that he is such an alcoholic and a womanizer that he's probably going to be dead by 50. Sorry, guys, that's James Bond. He never even lived. We believe our stories so much that if you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, you will find that a full discipline of science that we use every single day to solve complex problems, forensic science, the pioneer of forensic science is no other than a man who never lived, Sherlock Holmes. So we believe our stories and we make them, and the reason that we can do all of this is because the greatest character that has developed in us is what we call technological intelligence. The ongoing and dynamic process of solving problems and creating products through which we can expand our physical, cognitive, mental, and even social biological abilities. There are different definitions of what intelligence is, but all of them agree that intelligence entails the use of knowledge and reason in new situations. When you combine that with our technological ability to manipulate not only the environment, like the one that we're sitting in right here, but even our own bodies, you get technological intelligence. It's made of five different parts that create the system. Imagination, creation, communication, change, and intergenerational relations, all working together as one system. Let's take a look at the parts. Imagination. When I was five years old, sitting in L.A. at a curve, suddenly I saw in a car right next to me no other than Mary Poppins herself. Now, you can try to convince me that that was Julie Andrews. No, that was Mary Poppins. She waved at me and she smiled, and it turned into the spoonful of sugar that till this very day makes me smile as well. When she drove off, I'm telling you, she was on her way to her umbrella to go up to the stars. We need the tooth fairies and the Harry Potters and the wonderlands in our lives. They make our lives richer. They make us imagine somewhere over the rainbow there is a pot of gold, and boy, what I'm going to do with it when I find it. We fantasize about Oz long before we've left Kansas. And we don't stop at fantasizing, we create. I still have on my shelf, I admit, the little pot that I made for my mother when I was a child at ceramics class. She never used it, but she put it on the shelf saying it was too precious to use. Nice excuse. Any toddler that will be presented with Play-Doh or with Lego blocks, will use his imagination to create him something. That's what we do. We create, we design products, and we build them. But we don't stop even at that, because once we've achieved something and created it, we run to show and tell. We are the symbolic species of the world. 
developing recognized and accepted symbolic systems. The first time I went to Greece was probably the first and maybe only time in my life that I was actually grateful for mathematics, slaving over equations, not because they made me able to calculate, that I was able to read. Finally, I was walking the streets, and the alpha, pi, lambda, turned into the huge sign of the hotel that I was looking for, the Apollo Hotel. And anywhere in the world that I go, be it Harvard in Boston, or the Academia Sinica in ta Taiwan, or Oxford in England, if I use these lines and curves, everybody will know that I'm talking about water. And we are probably the only species that if we all just put our minds to it and learn what exactly those dots and lines and, and little things are on that piece of paper, we can turn it into a beautiful, identical piece of music. And we love change. Despite what we've heard, that we fear change, maybe we do, but we really need it. We crave change. We always want things bigger, faster, stronger. Think of the lines whenever a new cell phone comes out. Love of change that we need has taken us from standing at the tip of the ocean and looking and crossing it all the way to space, and we are already on our way to inhabit other planets. Change. It's not something that we can avoid. It's part of our biology. And once we've done something, we pass it on from generation to generation. The next generation will always continue where the previous one has stopped. A week ago, I was uh, driving, and I was thinking, debating with myself out loud, should I take a right left, a right turn, or a left turn to avoid traffic? And my three-year-old granddaughter was sitting in the back and saying to me, Grandma, just use Waze. <laughs> she was right, which I did. We don't have to carve on stone anymore. We don't even have to use ink anymore to write. We stand on the shoulders of giants who have already achieved something and continue from there. Our technological intelligence is the product of evolution. It developed in us. But it's not only the product of evolution. We also implement it through Darwinian laws. We use our technology as if we're, we're selecting evolution. Let's think about that one for a minute. Just think of your closets. How many clothes and shoes do you have? We, we create a wide variation of products and artifacts in each and every area of our activity. And then, after we've created this wide variation, we select the one that we like most, the Batmobile. And after we've taken our Batmobile and ran the streets, the next generation doesn't have to go back and paddle its feet in order to move from place to place. So where is all this taking us, this technological uh, intelligence of ours? In my opinion, it gives us huge power, very meaningful. We have become the most powerful and probably the most influ influential species on Earth. But with that power, comes a continuum that starts with success and goes all the way to danger. It's up to us to do three things. Use that continuum to choose through responsibility, through respect, and through sustainability. That is our human potential, our ability to choose where exactly we want to be when we use the powers that have developed in us through nature. I, for one, am a cockeyed optimist. Maybe because for, uh, for the past two years, I've been walking around with this. The picture of two embryos who have since then become two out of my four beautiful granddaughters. That is due to our technological ability, which I am very grateful for. A year ago, I was standing on the bridge of the, southern, the ocean diamond in the southern sea. 
the captain called me up and said, come look at the radar screen. So I walked up, I looked, there was nothing there, it was empty. That's exactly what I want you to see, said the captain. We are the only ones out here at sea. There's no one else around. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, usually when I show the empty radar to people, they'll look at it and they'll say, oh, how small and insignificant I feel in, the power of, in view of the power of nature. But you're smiling. How come you're smiling? And I said to him, you know, I'm standing on this metal shell in the middle of the largest body of water on Earth with a cup of cocoa, which I am raising now to you, looking at a screen that tells me that 20 kilometers around me, there's nothing but freezing sea. I'm not even supposed to be here biologically. When you show me another organism that can do that, I will salute it. But we are the only ones who have put our footprints on the moon. Right now, it makes me feel great. Wouldn't you? Thank you.